you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 17. We're going to be chatting with winemaking rock star Thomas Batchelder about organic and biodynamic wines. What are they? Do they taste different? And why should we care? Now, before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Deb Pike, who lives on Gabriola Island, which is close to Vancouver Island in BC. Deb emailed me to say, quote, Hi, Natalie. I just listened to episode 14, and you once again made great points about wine and marketing. This time, how women are marketed to in unimaginative ways. It's always been that way. Surprising that wine producers don't find a way to raise the price on girly bottles, like other products. Why does pink packaging always mean more expensive? Pink bikes, pink t-shirts, pink Prosecco labels? Thanks for your continuing support. I've launched my tasting party business, and I'll be hosting a tasting party next week. Italian wines and cheeses. I've learned so much in your wine and cheese classes, and we'll go back to the classes that you've stored online for us. Cheers, you are an inspiration. End quote. Well, Deb, thank you so much. That is so kind. I'm glad that you enjoyed the episode and my online wine and cheese classes. Now, you can find Deb and her tasting party business at www.tastebudswine.ca. Check her out. She's a real dynamo. I'll continue to give a shout out to those who've been kind enough to post a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, social media, or email. So if you want me to mention your website or social media handle, please include that in your review along with your name. I want to celebrate you and let others know how they can connect with you. Now, back to this episode. Thomas Batchelder is a winemaking superstar. Not only does he make wine in Niagara, Ontario, but he also has vineyards in Burgundy and Oregon. This is a man on a mission when it comes to cool climate Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. The Batchelder Project started with the 2009 vintage with the Three Terroirs series. Three regions, three wines. As he describes it, the hands, techniques, and the palates remain the same, only the terroirs change. And of course, terroir refers to that unique set of climate, soil, and local conditions that makes a wine specific to where it's grown. He joined me from his home in Niagara. There's a bit of an echo on his end, but this content is so good that I didn't want to skip the conversation or even edit it too heavily. So I hope you'll find it worthwhile too. Enjoy. Your thoughts turn to organic wines, biodynamic wines, sustainably farmed wines. But what does all of that mean? What's the difference between organic wine and, say, biodynamic wine? And are organic wines any better for you health-wise? Do you have less of a hangover? Our next guest is going to answer all of those questions for us about organic wine, Thomas Batchelder. Hello. Hello. I'm Hi, Lee. Thomas. To get us warmed up now, maybe before we dive into that topic of organic wines, can you remember the exact moment when you knew you wanted to make wine? When I came home, when I turned 18, I'm six foot five, nearly six foot four and three quarters, 196 centimeters. So I got a lot of drinking done before I was 18 in Quebec. <laughs> Not drinking, but tasting. And I started bringing wine home to the table for my parents probably much like you on Sunday nights and they love that and from there I got a home wine making kit and so that was probably it my brother bought it for me from there I became a wine journalist not as accomplished as yourself I showed promise and uh, from then 
I joined the Human Society of Wine Tidings La Barrique in Montréal and went to wine school from there in Burgundy. At the time, there was no Brock University. I fell right into the Pinot Revolution in Burgundy and rediscovered Chardonnay. That for many Maine holidays, as Montrealers and Ottawa people will do, they go to Maine. It's the closest. We love our Nova Scotia and our New Brunswick, but Maine's really close. And I've had so much bad Chardonnay down there. Now, caveat, California makes fabulous Chardonnay, but that's not what I was drinking. I was drinking 999 Chardonnay, which was pretty goopy. So when I went to Burgundy, of course, we all like the idea of organic gardens, no pesticides, no herbicides, and no synthetic fertilizers. But it was really in Burgundy's quality revolution because it was in the early 90s. And at the same time, all the young ones like Pascal Marchand, who later came to be my boss and friend through the Clos Jardin, they were turning things around and they have thousands of years old terroirs. And if they don't have that, they've got nothing. So they were first about protecting the earth and stewarding that land to future generations. After, did it taste better? Was it better for you? Something we can get to later in the show. But that's where it came from, learning to make wine and going to school in Burgundy. Okay, good. There's a nice sound. (laughs) I love that. Are you thirsty, Thomas? (laughs) Yes, I'm getting a little thirsty. I'm trying to guess what you have open. We'll see if I guessed right. Oh, well, you know, I kind of started top of the line because I was pre-tasting last night. And of course, one of your wines became our dinner wine. That was the Grand Reserve Pinot. I'm sure that's not where we want to start, but we want to start with the Pinots, I'll bet. Yeah, that's what I just popped because I wanted to make sure you got to it. Oh, that's what and you And I also popped. popped the Reserve. Yeah. Okay, yes. This is a stunning, stunning wine. Is there a particular story behind this wine, the Calis Grand Reserve? There sure is. That's a great okay. one to start with. The first thing is Calis is 100% organic. And the winemaking is organic, but here's the thing, and this is what I say at any trade show. I saw you at Taste Ontario, I'll probably be seeing you at Lifford Shows, which is our agent, comes to Ottawa. And I tell people right away, Calus is owned by 12 Quebecers who are in love with Ontario, in love with Niagara. And I said, we got to do organics. And they said, yeah, but, you know, we're new to this. I said, so don't certify. So my straight line on that is when you don't certify, nobody has to believe you. But huh. it's the truth. And someday we'll hopefully get around to certifying. But meanwhile, walk the walk and make good wines. It's a scary place, Ontario, in terms of only one thing. Those two big lakes have so much humidity. That's not like Burgundy. Burgundy's landlocked. And Oregon has those mountains from the sea. But we're right here. The summer is humid and the fall is humid. Mm. And that adds to fungus, right? Now, right. you can use sulfur and copper. They help. And those are mined minerals that are organic. But you got to watch it. We've been in the game eight vintages now, and we're still organic. But somebody wants to say to me, look, you want to walk the walk, buddy? Certify. I'll say, well, okay, well, you ready to write the check if something goes wrong? The main thing is do organic, and then after, fight it out with yourself whether you certify and with what body. You're saying if you have a bad year or there's a lot of mildew or rot, you may have to go off organic standards and do something to save the crop? That's right. One of the things you do is you get a sorting table when you make Pinot Noir. And when things go off, you may have to pick a couple of days earlier before things fall apart. There's an expression in our industry, fall apart. That means the rod advancing. Things are going perfectly and then the rains come in. There's a hurricane down in Louisiana and we get the tail end of that. Cabernet grapes are tight and hard and a month away. And Pinot is just blossoming and getting lovely. And that's when you say, get the sorting table out. Let's get some temporary workers. We need six people on the table at all time. And you can make beautiful wine in those years. So I would argue that you never have to resort to that stuff, right? And we had a wet summer last year, as you did in Ottawa, and Kalis didn't spray anything nasty. Okay. What's the difference between organic and biodynamic wines? By fluke, I was reading a new book that the guy really addressed it well. Michael Steenberg. Yes, he writes for Slate. Right, it works for sight. And he said very simply, of course, I'll just say it from my own experience, but I can't help but be influenced him because I read it this morning, lying in bed thinking about Earth Day. Organics and biodynamics are the same from an organic viticulture point of view and from a winemaking point of view. It's non-intervention. You can use mine minerals, like I said earlier, like sulfur and copper, put them into water and spray, and they help protect. 
any rainfall, they get washed right out. Now, one thing I want to say, I'm going to forget, so this is not about biodynamics, but whether you're in organics or biodynamics, the copper is a metal. It's a heavy metal, and you can eventually get toxicity in your soil. So even with organics and biodynamics, we are watching copper like a hawk. We have virgin soils over here compared to burgundy. So I learned from the Burgundians, they actually look at the load they're putting on a vineyard every year, and they try to skip treatments. Imagine that you're organic, you're using organic materials, and you're trying to skip treatments. It's like not taking your full antibiotic dose when you've been sick. But we do that to try to always use the least interventional land we can. So from there, biodynamics now does something else, which it really responds to the phases of the moon and the planets, and it looks at what time of the year, you know, how can the equinoxes not affect us? How can the solstices not affect us? My God, you know, animals howl at the moon. How can we not be affected? We're just not aware of it. So Rudolf Steiner, who thought up all this back in 1924 and brought this program to people in Germany and Poland who were having suffering crops from too much artificial fertilization. Fertilization is as big a problem as anything, right? It's not just the pesticides you spray and fungicides you spray. So fungicides is against rot. Pesticides is against bugs. And herbicides is against grass and weeds. You don't spray herbicides like Cadiz doesn't. You have to hand hoe or machine hoe it. It's a lot of work. And it makes the price of viticulture go up. But biodynamics goes one step further beyond the phase of the moon and everything and uses several preparations, all named 500 and something, that believe that when you use a homeopathic amount of something, it sends a signal that does a greater good. So, I mean, this is not biodynamic, but a crazy great example that I love is Oregon farmers sitting in their fields, seeing hundreds of birds coming in, killing a couple and, you know, burning them and putting their ashes on the end posts. And while that seems ridiculous, and I reacted like that back in early 2000, as ridiculous, but birds are super smart. And if they see their friends, they're earned, and they can smell that, you either believe that this stuff works or don't. Sounds like a Game of Thrones thing. Put them outside the city on the pillar walls or whatever. I think the thing is this. If this is too confusing, if people disagree with this, here's the thing. All biodynamic practitioners, of which I've only been in passing with the closure down, I've been organic all the time, but... I got to tell you, all biodynamic practitioners are excellent organic viticulturists as well, right? because they have to be paranoid and they have to be on the money. And if they're trying to skip a sulfur treatment or skip a copper treatment, all legal and organic, and replace it with a homeopathic treatment, they better be on their game. So it's a very, very admirable thing. And one that's probably better to do if your bank account's in the black, but also if you have a property of long standing, like Nicolas Jolie does in the Coulet de Savon, and he was able to figure it out based on a background of success already. Those are just my cautionary words. That's great. Does organic winemaking also mean natural fermentation, no added yeast or no cultured yeasts? Yeah, it does. And apparently now they've got some that are admissible in certain certifiers. So there's not only one certifying body, there's many. And you can choose them based on how proud you are of how stringent they are or who will let you get away with stuff. And getting away with stuff, what does that mean? It all depends on what lens you're looking through, but certainly I've always used wild yeast. Not because I want to be organic, which I do, but because wild yeast grows on the grapes in the vineyard in the year of that production. So if it's a year that's headed to 14% alcohol based on the sugar in the grapes, or a year that's headed to 11 and a half, those yeasts grew in that year too. There's lots of different clones of the yeast and they're all different and they add complexity. And almost for sure, when I smell a ferment, I can't say always in the bottle, Natalie, because there's so many other things like the length of the oak aging program and how long it was in bottle before to get more perfume in the bottle before it was released and all that stuff. But basically, though, in a ferment, I can smell it when there's a simplicity to added yeast. They can be fantastic and they make your life easier. They produce less volatility. They can be more reliable, but not always fermenters. So it's like a drug for winemakers. They can use a yeast from a package to get a desired flavor profile. But by mixing a bunch of packaged yeast, you do not get the complexity of wild yeast. Not because there's not as many different individuals, but because all those individuals have been selected and bred to be perfect. 
I'm not knocking yeast because when I have used it in the past, if you have a year that is 14.5 potential, in other words, enough sugar in the grapes to give you 14.5. I don't know if people realize this, but let me take one step backwards. When you have sugar in a grape, the yeast transform that into alcohol. We know that. But also the byproducts are CO2. So as the alcohol raises in a wine, in the vat, and the sugar goes down, the alcohol starts to be toxic to the yeast. So when you get closer to 13, 13, 5, 14, the yeast go, I'm done, I'm out of here. So the last few grams of sugar can be very hard to ferment. And that's where winemakers are totally organic, will buy an organic yeast and just finish off the ferment. Because if they don't, other bad things would start to happen, like volatility or the vinegar flavor rising. So in places that are routinely hot, like parts of California, People are worried about this, and so they will finish their ferments, even if they start wild. That's part of this whole cool climate thing. It's not organics. Niagara's hot, Prince Edward County's hot, because we regularly make wines between 12 and 13.2, naturally with no chaptalization. These cool climate wines are not only digestible by humans, but they finish their ferments naturally with wild ferment because the yeasts aren't as stressed. Yes. Health-wise, how does organic wine tie into health? Are they any better for us? What about hangovers? <laughs> the first thing I want to say is one of the aha moments for me is that sulfur and copper, which are used to spray organic vineyards, they're also used to spray conventional vineyards. They're cheaper to use than the big nasty chemicals out there. But it's funny because also when you're in a winery, if you add something, which I'm getting around to your question, you can add copper and sulfur. We've all heard of sulfites in wine and copper is only used in the winery at the last minute. We're talking about really homeopathic doses. What that does is help you if a wine is really reduced and smells like burnt rubber and garlic and nobody likes that, right? You try to avoid that. There's other ways of managing that in your fermentation and that's not what today's about. But here's something that almost smacks of either creationism or else very enlightened Darwinism, which is why is it that copper and sulfur work in the field and also work in the winery? Like who thought that up? Why is it that the fermentation gives off CO2, which protects the wine? And then when you put it in barrel, there's a malolactic fermentation, which also gives off CO2, thus protecting the wine. There's naturally sulfur that's occurring in wines, which protects the wine. Winemakers in Bordeaux, I think it was, figured out three centuries ago that if they burnt a sulfur wick in the barrel, the barrel stayed fresh. And then when the wine went in, that was their way of adding sulfur to the wine. So because biodynamics and organics have stringent levels of total sulfur you can use and free sulfur, organic winemakers are very aware of that and try to keep it low. So it's not because the fruit is better, unless somebody proves something about pesticides. So far, nobody's heard that pesticides in a wine have hurt a human being because everything drops out, right? Everything drops out with the leaves in the wine and you get this clear wine. That's the whole thing about wine, why it's so pure. Why people in Europe used to drink wine instead of water when the water supplies were doubtful because wine purifies itself. But generally, there will be less sulfites in organic and especially biodynamic wine. Also in natural wine, but that's a whole other <laughs> That's thing. another show. Organic grapes were much more available in Burgundy and Oregon than they are here in Niagara. And that's because it's harder here. So if you grow organic grapes, you keep them for yourself. It doesn't matter whether your name is Thomas Batchelder or Natalie McLean or Romani Conti. If you're working in Niagara and you don't own the vineyards, you have to kind of just be happy with the best vineyards you can get and then encourage them to become organic. And it'll happen slowly. We know that this world can't continue at the rate it's going. And not only about plastic water bottles, right, which we hear a lot about today, it's about everything. We have to find really smart ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. It's not just a thing for hippies anymore, ex-hippies. It's a thing for everybody. Someday, everything will have to be organic. And that's not like my fervent belief it is, but it's just the way it's going to have to go if we're going to have this many people on the planet. Yeah, you know, especially enjoying good wine. Yes. <laughs> Happy people on the planet. How about cellaring? Do organic wines cellar well, Thomas? Well, you know, I think Peter Gamble, who's done so many good things right now, he's starting VQA out in Nova Scotia and doing Benjamin Bridge and Lightfoot Wolf Phil. But here he does Stratus and he's done a bunch of things like Ravine. And one of the things he said to me is, Thomas, you can't be a lover of terroir and not be a lover of vintages. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, like, you have to accept 
the role of the vintages and enlightened consumers should accept that a wine is 13.5 one year and 11.5 another. It leaves winemakers more ability to just deliver the real thing. But what trumps almost everything is old vines and terroir. When you have a great single vineyard, in France it's called the Premier Cour, Grand Cru, Burgundy. We have a great single vineyard with older vines. What they deliver is something that the consumers don't hear about much, but it's called dry extract. En français, extrait sec. And Rudolf Steiner did a lot of this, but so do normal scientists. When you boil down a wine and the only thing that's left is the dry extract, it's like the soul of the wine, the stuff that came from the grape skins that makes a wine have more minerality or more tension. Aside from acidity, it's what you extracted that gave the flavor. And you can go look it up online as it pertains to wine. The dry extract and the soul of the wine, the year it was grown in, all that stuff adds up together. So it's tannin, alcohol. Some wines hold on acidity. Some wines hold on tannin. Some wines hold on alcohol and age and improve. You need all three, but the best thing is a great site with older vines, perfectly farmed. Believe me, it's a simple recipe, easy to say, hard to find. Where do you find old vines in Prince Edward County? Old vines, what they do is they buffer out. En français, c'est l'effet tampon. It buffers out the hot years. So old vines with deep roots, in hot years, those deep roots get water and they still make a good fresh wine. In wet years, when the young vines with their surface roots are just soaking up the rain and making bloated grapes that don't taste like anything, the old vines are like, okay, by the time you get down to my roots, the water won't be as much of an effect. I'm not saying old vines are the only good wines. What I'm saying is usually the wines that will age the best is a well-balanced year with wines that have lots of soul and dry extract. Macerated well, but not too much, just everything in balance. Those are the ageable wines. I love that concept of dry extract. I can almost apply it to humans <laughs> at the end of our life as we become <laughs> shriveled and wizened and dried up. But it's kind of who we are and our personalities have concentrated. Anyway, probably not That's the right true. analogy. One thing, and I mean, we all say like, I need a drink sometime. But aside from that time, I would like to talk about times when you're somewhere. And whether it's a wine bar in New York City or Ottawa or Vancouver, downtown Portland, or in a vineyard in the Loire or somewhere... And you just take a glass of wine and beyond the alcohol, beyond the flavor, it's almost nourishing. Yes, when it's say, like a plant that comes back to life. Like, yeah, that moment is the soul, what the French call energy, what scientists call dry extract, terroir, minerality. All that comes together. And that is the nourishing aspect of wine. Really, it is. Ultimately, I'm a great, great lover of red wines. But the reason the planet invests more and the red wines go to higher, except for the Montaché and Great Rieslings. The reason it goes more to red is reds tend to have more dry extract and hence more ageability. Whites spend two, three hours in the press. Reds spend three weeks on their skins and then an hour in the press. They've been to the school time. longer. They've been to school longer. They went to yeah. graduate degrees or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, can I tell you one thing yes. about the Cadiz Grommers? <laughs> I'm not an investor, but I've been with Cadiz since day one and Kalos made it possible for Batchelder to exist because I was able to not take a salary from Batchelder. Something Mary doesn't like too much because she's worked for us for eight years. But we're trying to build something small and cool. And we're so enthralled to be the first Quebecers like over the moon about Niagara. I said, what do you want? They said, well, you have full reign. We started back in 10. And they said, well, we want a tradition, a reserve, and the Grand Reserve. Your choice. Each one is a blend of the two vineyards, Beamsville and Jordan, about 11 clicks apart. And as you get to the Grand Reserve, you get more to the old Le Clos Jordan site. That's 70% of New Dorf, which used to be called Le Petit Cardin. And it is like chewing on wet stones. And we go to the best part of that vineyard, and then we take the best barrels, Kelly and I, the associate winemaker, Kelly Mason. And we always look for something chiseled that doesn't give it up right away. So it's Tradition Reserve and Grand Reserve. And the reserve, which I also opened because you opened it, yes. is more punchy yeah. and a little more obvious, but still luscious and lovely. And Tradition, that's the one you see in the LCBO and the Stick U most of the time. Yes, absolutely. Hey, Natalie, can I say yeah. something about yeast? Sure. Here's the thing. Wild yeast are everywhere in nature, right? And when you start a new winery, you're worried that the wild yeast won't come because it's a crystal clean building, but they do come, okay? okay? And I've seen this a couple of times in startups in Oregon and here. 
but this is where you have to rely on the French because French is champignon. So in French, yeast, la levure, is a champignon. In English, it's a fungus. But we don't think of a yeast as a fungus. We think of it as yeast. But whatever it is, when you apply too many fungicides on your plant to kill rot, you killed the wild yeast. Oh. So that is why organics is hand in hand with wild yeast. But let me tell you, okay. that's a great news. So you're not killing the wild yeast. The bad news is, wow, you can get some bad funk with organics. You've got to really know what you're doing, especially in Ontario. Ontario is one of the best future places to make great Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, amongst other things. But it's also one of the most precarious, right? We have this thin mass of land that's called Niagara and a thin band called Lake Erie North Shore and another thin band called Prince Edward County. And they're all in contact with water. So we're extremely continental and we're almost like maritime as well. When Europeans come, who used to come to visit me at the Closed Jardin or come now to visit us at Calis or Batchelder, if they have come right from the airport, and they've been sleeping because they're tired on an overnight flight or whatever. And they wake up in Beansville and they look at it Lake Ontario. They think it's the ocean. Oh, you're on the East Coast. Well, yeah, it's a little more center than the East Coast. And that's Lake Ontario. You can't see across it. You, know, you can see Toronto off the side, but that way you can't see across it. So that water has a profound effect. I like to think when we harvest Burgundian varietals, we are very much like Burgundy. We're at the end of when these varietals will ripen September without rotting. But once you push through those rains, then you become maritime like Bordeaux because the water in Lake Ontario stays warm. Lake Ontario never freezes for a long time. And that's another show, the whole thing about the lakes. It's a fascinating subject. It's taken me years to sort of half understand, you know? Wow. Okay, so that's fantastic. Thomas, we should taste through these wines a bit more. What would you like to do next? Well, we've mentioned all three Pinots. Did you want to say anything more about the Pinots? No, the Cadiz Pinots is just wild yeast, minimal intervention, everything by gravity, and then yep. 16 months of barrel age. And okay. I'm going to say something about barrels and Chardonnay, but I'll try not to say it now. But what I'll say about barrels and Pinots, because you buy a cheap wine out there and it's oak chips and it's for the effect of the oakiness. Winemakers at a very high level, like 20 bucks and above, they do not want oakiness. They want silkiness and what's the word, suaveness or suavity? Sure. Yeah, that's it. They want terroir in their wines. And the best way to kill terroir is to have too much oak. So the idea that oak is a vessel that oxygenates a wine. Think of tawny port in oak for 10 years or 20 or 30 and vintage port in oak for a year or two. So vintage port is impenetrable and you need 20 years of bottle to get there. Tawny port doesn't smell like oak, smells like a nectar, right? Yes. If you can ever have a 20 or a 30, which Natalie, I know you have, and I've had a couple, but when I go into a wine bar, I'm like, what, 40 bucks a glass? No thanks. And so with Pinot Noir, 16 months in oak is not to oak. The verb to oak does not exist in my vocabulary. It's to barrel age, and the oxygenation in the barrel makes things perfumed and lovely and textured. It's so hard to talk about texture. And I can't do it. Yeah. We've learned to talk about minerality and try to differentiate it from tannins and acid. But texture, the wine has it or it doesn't. I love trying to get at texture. But you're right. It's such an important thing that we miss often. What is your favorite pairing for any of these Pinots? Food pairing. I would love to have maybe a tender piece of veal, some game birds like quail, Cornish hen. Not very imaginative. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good already. I would say Eric Lemelson, sir, Lemelson Vineyards, where I worked for four vintages out west from 99 to 2002. He's a vegetarian, a pescatarian, and he ate a lot of wild West Coast salmon with Pinot, which I found a pity at the time. But he's been a great influence in my life because I love wild salmon with Chardonnay. It's so good. But Pinot goes really, really well with salmon. It shouldn't be forgotten. He taught me that. With these wines open, we're going to do a salmon on the barbecue tonight because we can, because it's 16 degrees here. It's 14 in Ottawa, isn't it? Hey, yes, awesome. it's like midsummer oh. here. <laughs> All of a sudden. And I would say that, and then I would have to go, people say duck and peanut, but I would have to go with Natalie on this one. Chicken, fowl, pan fat, guinea fowl, pheasant. Anytime somebody will make those things for you, you should bring them a bottle of peanut. Okay, there you go. Like, I just find it so food friendly, just about anything. 
and really, if you like Pinot and that's what you want to drink, just have a bun in between if it's not going with the food. We don't need to get too caught up on perfect pairings. But there is an optimization of pleasure if you if you want to partake. What would you say for cheeses? Would you say a soft cheese or? I don't know. That's a tough one. The time I spent in Burgundy, worked for three domains over there after school, including Jeanne Boulanger and Marius de Larche and Pernon Vergeles. And then, of course, when I went back there for Batchelder, I watched the times change. And the Burgundians literally, when they move to their cheese, whether it's Camembert, Epoisse, or very, very rarely a cheddar, but they would more likely, when they feel in a cheddar mood, go to a Comte, because it's just 60 clicks away in, in the Jura. So a Comte or cheddar kind of cheese, although they have very different flavors, they always switch back to Chardonnay. Right. Yeah. And yeah. they love it. And I got to say that with cheese and Pinot, for me, it works so well. But watch yourself and say to yourself at a dinner party or just alone, can I really taste the Pinot the way I did now? Or is yeah. it just total pleasure? Total pleasure is good, too. I'm not against that. But if you've paid a lot of money for a Pinot, mm. I might be more like, let's finish it before the cheese or come to it after the cheese. Now, I would love to be educated if somebody knows how to counter that statement. Oh, have you ever tried that truffle inflected cheese? That uh, sounds great. Yes, it's called Trufo. There's probably other brand names for it. That would be a killer with Pinot Noir. But you're right, Thomas. I think there's such a mouth coating texture, the richness, the fatness. You need a Chardonnay with good acidity. And our last talk a year ago, we were talking about that. One of the many reasons why you like to do Pinot than Chardonnay, or at least that you learned about it, was that the French would start off and they'd have their Pinots and so on with the meal. And then at the end, when the cheese plate came out, they'd go to the Chardonnay. And one more point that you brought up last year that I just want to make sure we include this year was that a lot of people feel like they have to go to whites always first and then go to reds, whereas what they really want to do is just get to the reds. So give them the reds first. That's what they want. Then they'll relax. And then there is this interesting thing that happens after tasting reds and then going to whites. It's like you relax and your palate, I guess, I don't know if it's more open, but then you start to appreciate Chardonnay where you think you might not have liked it in the past. That's beautiful. Well put. I have nothing to add to that. I forgot we talked about that. You know, one of the things I wanted to say was also the concept that John Sambrook, who started the Epimian Society in Canada, taught me about the sacrificial lamb. If I may especially talk about dinner parties, if you have... The old way of saying this would have been a great burgundy, a premier cru or grand cru you want to show. Let's put that on its ear and say, you want to show what you think is a great Canadian Pinot. So you pull out something from Flat Rock or something from Hidden Bench, Malavoir, whoever. And now at the table, let's make it more complex. You have friends who are not convinced about Canadian wines, certainly not Canadian red wines. What I would do in a case like that, I would get a pretty good burgundy or Oregon or California, pretty good. Not too good. So you're serving a single vineyard from Canada, 40 bucks, let's say. Now you start with a 25 buck wine. Do not let them finish the bottle. It's a sacrificial lamb. So they get that Pinot in their mouth, right? And then you take it away and put it on the sideboard. And now you serve the whole bottle of your top wine. So it could be Canada in this, but it could be Burgundy. And also the concept of vintage comes in. Yeah. If you want to serve something old, don't serve the first wine being new. Don't serve a 2015 and then a 2009. Serve in 2012, then in 2009. The main thing is, do not ever, in my humble opinion, serve a great wine, whether it's from Canada or elsewhere. Put it cold to your people and expect them to understand it. Give them a lead up of something less good. And why I say a Bourgogne Pinot Noir or a lesser village, I don't want to say what village, but I'll just say that if you taste the wines before, of course, and you say, yes, this is a good progression from a Burgundy from a Burgundy wine to a Canadian wine or from an Oregon wine to a Canadian wine. I like this progression. Half the bottle, they like it, pour it. Never say this is the best Canadian wine ever. You must like it. You have experience with this, Natalie. It's not going to convince the doubting Thomases. Excuse the expression. I think the way to do it is lead them into it, right? I love that idea, the sacrificial lamb. I've only had the concept of the decoy wine, like the wine I want people to go for if they... Don't know anything about wine. <laughs> it's like, here, have this. <laughs> but the sacrificial lamb, I like that concept even better. But you know what? It makes sense because even when I'm tasting anything, whether personally or professionally, your first taste of the day, your palate is not calibrated, not to get too fussy and fancy or precious about it, but that acidity hits you, that flavor hits you, and it's like, oh, 
I always say, don't judge a wine, any wine on the first sip. So what we're doing is sort of conditioning their palates the way we would condition a glass, maybe roll that glass around, get the wine all coating it and then dump it out so that we don't get any detergent smells, nothing. So we're calibrating our palate and then bringing on the wine, as you said. But I love that sacrificial lamb much better than my decoy wines. Well, it's different. You know, you're just using a wine to set up another wine to make sure it shows well. And remember to taste them both before and remember to think about vintage, right? Two similar vintage wines. I would love to taste a Cabernet Franc if you're up for it. Yes, absolutely. Let's do that. I think that the reason it's taken me years to understand this because I'm a slow learner. I'm not from here. I'm from Quebec. But when I came back from Burgundy, I hoped to get the Eastern Townships going on Pinot Noir. And some people are doing it, but techniques have advanced. They've got geothermal carpets and stuff. Now, whoa, that was a good one. But then it wasn't a possibility, just like when I went to school, it was not a possibility to come to school at Brock. And Brock and Niagara College are doing wonderful things in turning out viticulturalists. My nephew, Noah Higgins, is at right now doing viticulture at Niagara College and has come from Montreal to not become a winemaker, but to make great grapes. You know, so Niagara is really doing it now in terms of schools, but didn't exist when I was there. So what also didn't exist was Cabernet Franc. When I first visited Niagara, people were only doing hybrids back in 87 when I visited. And a lot of wine writers are going out on a limb. And I'll test you, Natalie, and you'll have your own preferences. But most people say, if we had to have five here, they would do Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Gamay, and Cabernet Franc. That's what they would do in Niagara. What have you thought over the years about that? What do you think works? So the ones that you mentioned, you went quickly, but Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc, Riesling, Pinot Noir, Gamay, but also Chardonnay, for sure. Chardonnay, yeah, for sure. For sure. But the others are either experimental and not much of a track record to go on, not consistent, not the volume. So I'd be looking for that first before recommending. But those would be the six grapes I would go with. Yeah. Well, what convinced me about Cabernet Franc, which we do for Cadiz, but not for Batchelder, Mm -hmm. is that the guy who set up a Soyuz La Rose out west, he comes from Bordeaux, and he set up Painted Rock. Oh, yes. It's this new venture, Kumina, also set up Cadiz. This were just friends of mine. I never thought I'd work for them. I thought I was going to move to Burgundy for my next job. Well, as it turned out, we started batch other and they started Kalis, and we've done both since day one. But this guy's name is Alain Sutre, S U T R E. You can definitely Google him. He's one of Bordeaux's great consultants, but more on the viticulture side. And he said that the Beamsville Lincoln Lakeshore has a specific avocation for Cabernet Franc Merlot on the blue clay soils they have there. And I only found out, and I thought, what's this consultant? Tell them I knew him for years. But I mean, why is a consultant telling them to do something, the boys at Quelos, when they want to have an all Pinot domain? Their domain was patterned after the Clos Jordan. They love the Clos Jordan and they wanted to do it themselves. Well, he did it because of the soils. And for that, I got to say, if any of you out there are a consultant and you get your client to do something they don't want to do, you have to wear the load if it doesn't work out, right? Mm-hmm. I consult too. I'd be more like, where do you want to get? Let me help you get there. He was, you will plant Cabernet Franc and Merlot here because it's like Pomerol. And when the French are like that, remember, French Canadian is not French, right? right. French Canadian is Quebecois and the French are the French. If you talk to French Canadians about the French, it's a different deal. They have an entitlement that none of us North Americans have, but they're also very smart and they have years of tradition. So it's the same uh, soils or similar soils to Pomerol and blue, blue soils. Clay, yeah. What does blue clay do for this wine? Why does it work for? Because this well, you, is gorgeous. This you know, Pomerol and Fonsac are pretty flat. So that's right bank Bordeaux. And people forget that over in Bordeaux, it's not just, oh, the left bank people want more Cabernet Sauvignon. It's that the right bank can't ripen it for some reason. I can't remember. We've all read this. But the point is, they ripen Merlot fantastically in Cabernet Franc. And my first year in the cellar with these with Cadiz, I put a drop of Cabernet Franc into the Merlot in a barrel, and the Merlot suddenly was so dense, suddenly came alive, and it had some aroma and perfume and some gravel. With the Cabernet Franc, you put a drop, and this is 14% Merlot, which is legal. On the label, it's Cabernet Franc. We put 14% Merlot in. The reason being, it got really confusing having Cabernet Franc hyphen Merlot and another one that was Merlot hyphen Cabernet Franc. That means the percentage, right? The way the laws go, 
So if you have more than 15% of any variety, it has to be hyphenated on the label. So we keep it less than that, but I wish the laws would change. The other thing you can do, this is a great thing about marketing, you can have blended red wine. So Calus Summum or Summus, and then you do whatever the hell you want. You can call it Meritage, but Meritage is officially dead. It's ugly contraction of heritage and merit, I think. Started in the States. For the Bordeaux blend. With Bordeaux blend. But here in Niagara, where Cabernet Franc goes so well, just a little bit of Merlot thickens out the mid palate. Is know? this anything like Shiraz and a dash of Viognier? Like Yeah, it's like that. It really is like that. Okay. In the cellar, it's what I realized slowly that Alain Soutre had done a great, great thing. He had honored the terroir at the risk of losing his job because he hadn't seen this blue clay. Higher up the hill, it's red clay. That's why the closure then had a vineyard called Claystone. And Maury Taz has a vineyard called Redstone because those red soils, they're just slightly reddish. And the blue soils are slightly blue. And the sandy soils are slightly sandier as you get close to the lake, right? But they're all right. variations on a theme. But isn't this lovely? It is and- gorgeous, I must say. Tasting is subjective, but I get like this sort of violets, the blue florals. Yeah, for sure. Blue florals. It is violets. And that's just long, long barrel age. Remember, with longer barrel age and not too much oak, not too much new oak, it's all in oak. But the wine digests it and it mm. puts out this beautiful perfume. So there's tradition reserve and Grom reserve. And the difference here is that the Grom reserve is a Merlot with some Cab Franc. We're going to taste that. The one thing I would like to do is, you know, that Sideways movie. Yes. Does everybody remember that has done us Smile. all so much good? Smiles. Yes. I'm not both. drinking anymore. Freaking Merlot. <laughs> That's right. And you know what? Here's the thing. The California Merlot he was talking about, I think, is baked and tasteless. Yeah. But Merlot is a grape grape. The truth is, here's the grapes that die in hard Niagara winters. The grape vines that die back to the ground are Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, and Syrah, and Givers Treminer, and a few more. Okay. So here's the concept. Imagine you just won the lotto and you're buying in Niagara. In Niagara, if you put something in your stable that could die back in a cold winter, you might say, what's that in my business plan for? But the answer is all those grapes unfortunately, ripen beautifully here when it hasn't been a tough winter and have classic mid-Atlantic flavors. Like you have to question yourself whether Sauvignon Blanc, Gewurz, Viognier, Syrah, and of course Merlot from Niagara are from here or from the old world that they're done well. Mid-Atlantic meaning they have characteristics of both the old world and new yeah. world? Yeah. Mid-Atlantic, not in the U.S. The U.S. has appropriated that term for several sure. states, but I'm talking about not quite as far as the Azores. The Cabernet Franc, I could go back to it, and this is a long yeah. discussion, but I would just like to touch on it is Loire Cabernet Franc is great, and you have to get into the bell pepper there and love it, and you can also get into their great limestone terroir. But Cabernet Franc over there, they haven't done the world's best job of getting it out to the rest of the world. It's just okay. like fact. So people diss it for no good reason. When you go to the Loire, it's one of the loveliest wines in France. In California and places like that, it doesn't have a true varietal character except for the coolest sites. So I always say when you taste a Cabernet Franc, it should taste like bell pepper a bit. A little bit. But not, but not in spades. Certain Kiwi Sauvignon Blancs takes like cat's pee and it's just a bit. Right. And that's or a fine. little grassy is okay, but a lot of gra- like rev your lawnmowers. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> no. And so in Niagara, we have people doing massive extracted Cabernet Francs with American oak barrels that remind one of a Zinfandel. You have people doing very, very fruity style ones. Very few people doing no Cabernet Sauvignon, just Cabernet Franc and Merlot. So that first wine is, if you're a lover of right bank Bordeaux, so Francac, Pomeral, Saint-Semillon and its satellites, Côte de Blaye and Côte de Bourg, people don't know those wines as much as they should. And that was the first place I ever visited before going to Burgundy. So great love for Cabernet Franc and Merlot and their association with Cabernet Sauvignon is a different thing for a warmer climate, like left bank Bordeaux up in Poyac and saint julien and Grave. On the other side, these wines in Canada, when you put Merlot and Cabernet Franc together, they're more like a Saint-Emilion. So I encourage your readers to check out a Saint-Emilion, see if they can like that before yeah. they come back to Niagara Cabernet Franc. Yeah, that would be an interesting comparison. This is an extraordinary Merlot. I just, I love it. 
This has 15% of Cabernet Franc in it. It's from 13, so it's the oldest wines we're going to taste before we go to the white wines. Yes. And you see that Canada is capable of delicacy. We are really trying to develop a collegial atmosphere here in Canada right now. It's Canada's time. I mean, the elder Trudeau was wrong. It didn't quite happen. But for many reasons, Canada's happening now, not just wine. And I like to think every year we all go over to London. None of us can afford it. The Queen's birthday this year, it's May 17th. 40 Canadian wineries on Trafalgar Square. And for those listeners who aren't Canadian or don't remember, and I certainly didn't know, growing up in Quebec, you don't hear so much about the Queen, but you do. But in Trafalgar Square with the National Gallery and Nelson's Column and the Lions, you have New Zealand House, Australia House, South Africa House, and Canada House. Last time they checked, Canada House was worth $1.5 billion or something. But it's free for Canadians to do trade missions there. So on the May 17th, there will be 40 wineries there from BC to Nova Scotia, including Quebec, doing their great wines there. And the British wine writers, we get the good ones because it saves them a trip to this big country. And we get the good ones every year. We've been six years in a row. And they taste stuff like this Merlot. And they just think, how is it possible? And I say, what are you shocked about? And they say, I'm not shocked that it's a good region because we've seen lots of good regions come on, New Zealand, South Africa, or again, they've seen them over the years, Eastern Europe. But what they're shocked at is Canada's subtlety when it's done well. It's not just powerhouse, it's subtlety, and it really is cool climate. And the world needs more of those regions, right? You said in the past, too, power and complexity and so on can come in a small frame. Yeah. And I think the analogy you made the last time we talked is imagine clothing. You pay more for a silk shirt. It's delicate. It's exquisitely crafted. But it's not the more you pay, the bigger the clothing. It's actually you can pay for something that's small and exquisite. That's right. And so Natalie might be wearing a lovely silk top and I might be wearing a heavy cotton roots thing. We might be both comfortable, but hers is more elegant and maybe easier to rip. My roots thing won't rip, but it's more like it's not a croissant. It's mine would be whole wheat bread. But, you know, <laughs> both things are important in life, right? Absolutely. But, um, all right, there let's move on to the Chardonnay then. What would you point out? I've got four of your whites here. I would do the audacious thing I've never done, so let's do it on the show. Okay. Let's finish with the Calus because yes. that puts it in the cleanup position. Okay. And that's a tough position for it because of where it's located, but I think we'll understand and hopefully people will try this. Of mine, do you want to try just the 213s or do you want to do the 12 and the 213s? Up to you. I'm fine either way. I've got them all here. Okay, let's do the 12 from Saunders Vineyard. This is okay. in Beamsville. One thing I should say is that people should come and visit Niagara because they would see things like, let's say you go to Burgundy and you say, oh, I just can't remember the Burgundian villages. Why do these people, they all know so much and how come I can't learn them? Well, the first time you get in a car or a train or a bicycle from Dijon and you go south past these mythical villages and you see, you know, Gervais Chambertin, Maurice Saint-Denis, Chambon Musigny, Claude de Rougeau, sitting up there in the fields, you don't forget it. Hmm, and if yes. you actually make the effort to come to Niagara, well, like, we want you to drink Niagara, but if you make the effort to come here and you see Grimsby, Beansville, Vineland, Jordan, on a bench, much like in Burgundy, perhaps not quite as pretty as the oldest buildings, but um, the point is that you will remember by seeing, and you will truly see that Beansville, an Olympic athlete could throw a very long ball and hit the lake. So Beansville is at once. Whatever you think of Niagara and the lake, Beansville is the same thing except on a bench. It's so close to the lake, and yet it's a bench. Anyway, so this Saunders is very close to the lake and organically grown by the Saunders family. Warren Saunders is now 92, and he was born here to a Jamaican family and was for a long time, and maybe still now, the only Jamaican derivative family on the bench, grew up in the Hamilton Steel Mills and bought a farm. And Bepi Crozarial from the Globe wrote a great story on Saunders. I don't know if that's still available online, but this is one of Canvas unsung pioneers. Unsung because they never did a winery. Wineries get you notice. You can grow good grapes, but wineries get you notice. So this Saunders has always a honey characteristic to it. Do you get that, Natalie? Yeah, absolutely. This is just gorgeous. It is beautiful. Beeswax and toasted almond. I'm loving it. 
And I love Sanders. what I'm putting there. I 13 know. Sanders. Let's do that. So one year younger, your kids drink wine. No. I exposed my son early to wine, and I made sure it wasn't a sweet wine. He thinks it's totally yuck. So it was bitter, and I did it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> Same with us, though. I mean, <laughs> the girls like wine at six and eight years old, and now they're 18, and 19, and 21, and they tolerate wine. But when they go with friends, they still want those drinks with the little umbrellas in them. That's okay. So isn't that lovely? Okay. Yeah. 12 absolutely. is a hot year, well-preserved. This is 13, a cool year, obviously looking very mineral. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let us do the last two, then. You get the record for the time here, and I know you're going to be going to a barbecue, having food soon. So, so this is a uh, Oregon Johnson Vineyard. I drove the ripper on this property to rip the ground back in 2000, and Eric Lemelson planted it. And this is a fabulous piece of uh, plot in Oregon. Bachelor doesn't have a tasting room. We'll have one soon. You have to have five acres of land, and we're too poor for that. But you know, by the way, micro negotiations in Burgundy is considered a very noble thing. The first kid in the family gets the land. The second kid has to buy grapes if they want to be in the wine business. And that's the way it goes because nobody can afford land anymore. Huh. So they're the ones who turn me on to the concept of buying grapes, not wine, but buying grapes. And so anyway, I started to buy when I worked at Limelson Vineyards after I started Batchelder, after the closure down, I started by Johnson Vineyard, even though I had helped plant this. And I got to tell you, the fact that Oregon has zero limestone does not mean it has zero minerality. And why I was talking about a tasting room was because I can't get these wines to people direct. Lifford is our distributor and, and they bring them in. And in Quebec, it's Celeste Leville. But what they can do is go to the LCB or the SAQ or wherever they live and go to their product consultant or read Natalie's site and say, I want a fine Oregon Chardonnay. And I do mean fine, because mm -hmm. fine is always never over oak, never sweet, right? When you do that, even right after a Niagara, which is the worst position to put this, because Niagara wines just sort of sparkle with the limestone minerality. This has sedimentary stone minerality, which is not a bright minerality, but it almost has a salty sea tang, because the sedimentary rock used to be under the sea, and when the mountains came up, right? So that's how the Willamette Valley was formed. But they're heavier soils in the Oregon region? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thin. But they don't get much rain. Thin. Okay. Dense and lots of sun. So I try to put this in a way that makes sense for everybody. Wine is often measured its acidic content in pH and acidity, total acidity. Mm -hmm. Without getting too heavy, I'll just say that you can have the same acidity in Burgundy, Niagara, and Oregon, and Oregon will seem the more fat wines. So I select the best barrels and the most tightest looking barrels out of this. It doesn't quite have the pop of Niagara. But it certainly is savory and lovely. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yes. It's gorgeous. You know, I can see the signature with all of these wines, even though they're in the different regions, which I know Same is what barrels. you're trying to achieve. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to. Definitely. We both brought up kids, and we know that when you start bringing up kids, you think, and for those of you who haven't had kids, don't start. There's still time not to start. No, seriously. <laughs> for those of you who haven't had kids, always think about the way you were brought up and know that young parents because you're de facto young when you start, you think, I am not going to make this, this, this mistake with my kids. Here's what I'm going to do. And it's all this I, I, I stuff. The minute you have a kid, you realize it's them, them, them. You're stewarding them, right? And it's not noble or anything. It's the only way to do it. You can't apply the same technique of raising kids to two separate kids because one will resist this, the, the other one will resist something else. The other one will pretend to go along, but ultimately resist. And so... What happened is that with winemaking, yes, I do exactly the same thing in Oregon, Burgundy, and Niagara. Same barrel, same technique, same head, yeah. same hands, as you said earlier. But ultimately, the kids don't listen to me all the time. So it's not like, oh, I'll chaptalize everything. You know, Oregon doesn't need chaptalization. It's 13.5. Niagara needed a bit. Burgundy needed. No, no. We let them be. And we try to get them all through high school and university. <laughs> yes. And if they don't go to university, that's okay. If they that's want to be it. an artist, it's okay. So local chefs in Niagara, man, I love olive oil. But Michael Olson, I saw him the other day, he said, man, you got to go to Ontario's best canola, cold-pressed canola. It has a total terroir of its own. It's great, great with food. And I'm like, wow, like everything's happening here. It's happening fast. 
And people are starting to believe that you don't have to go to the States, get known and come back here, that actually the new generation is actually going to believe if their parents say Ontario wine, they're going to go blah, blah, blah. But in some <laughs> cases, we have so many new Canadians, which is a, you know part of the great strength of our country. They will actually believe I am deciding that Norman Hardy is good. I just use him because he's a buddy and he's a pioneer out in Prince Edward County. You know what? I just believe that these kids, if they find something, and I can mention 25 other names, if they find something that's local and good, they shouldn't only eat the 100-mile diet. They should drink the 100-mile diet. Right? Absolutely. Love all those points there. No more Shania Twain's Celine Dion oh. validation from the U.S. I like the sort of almost backlash. We will decide for ourselves. Ontario's good. All right. The Kalis? This is the toughest wine of the tasting. This is All a right. great wine. So for those of you who know your Burgundies, you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. And if you don't, I'll just give you some villages to Google later. So the classic Côte de Bone villages are Corton Charlemagne in Alice Corton, Bone, Merceau, chassaigne mont and pruligny mont Okay. Then two hours to the south, they make fabulous wines in the Maconnais, but the Grand Cru's there are Puy Fusse and saint Veron. If you were sitting in Burgundy and you would dare to pour a Puy Fusse, which is a great wine, costs 30 or 40 bucks a bottle, after a $100 Merceau, people would say, what are you smoking? Why are you doing that? Well, I'm doing that right now because this Calus comes from the Lincoln Lakeshore, so it's on sandy soils near the lake. It's not on the bench. But it has a typicity that's all its own. And I think the first people to do Lincoln Lake Shore were probably Creekside and then Francois Morissette, a good buddy of mine who's been here since about 2008, has been doing a lot of Lincoln Lake Shore. The bench is the finest, maybe, just like the Premier Cruise of Burgundy. But Lincoln Lake Shore has a thing all its own. And the other one like that is Creek Shores. Creek Shores are in Jordan. Lincoln Lake Shores are in Beamsville. And these are on the flat. But guess what? Nothing in Niagara's on the flat because everything eventually has to go to the lake, right? Mm -hmm. So this has a more plush feel to it always. But I put it after our premier cruise because I wanted to show you that different is still good. Totally different. But so lovely. That's the first time I do Puy Fuisse after the Greats of Bone. Put another way, Lincoln Lakeshore after Niagara Bench. <laughs> and it stands up. It's just I, different. I love the parallels it, it, you're drawing here. It does stand up. It does not suffer by comparison. It stands as its own signature. Oh my goodness, we've never gone this long. Tribute to you, but we will wrap up, Thomas. Is there anything you want to mention before we do that? Is there anything we've left out? I really, really want to say that organic wine always tastes better, but there's such crosshatch these days of natural wines, organic wines. It used to be when I looked at the organic wine section at the LCBO and the SAQ and in the States, I would go, I love the intent, but I'm going to go get something classic. That was 20 years ago. Now I go to the organic wine section. I know it's going to be good. I can't assure you that it will be better. And all I can encourage people is the fact that I've chosen and I will continue to choose to go down the organic route. I want to make and I want to drink classic wines that represent their terroirs. That's what I like. And if it can be organic, so much the better. And I think we should all try to keep our wine loving hats on and not only the organic. We shouldn't drink bad organic wine and we shouldn't drink bad conventional wine. We should push the conventional people towards organics and try to continue them. So I think you can go out there and buy organic wines and encourage those producers for sure. Do it. Do it. But also buy wines that encourage your love of wine. Wine is unquantifiable. Don't only keep it to organic wines, but really do keep the great terroirs, whether organic or not. And ask those hard questions when you visit producers in France, in Niagara. Couldn't you do at least one block organic? Help the movement along, right? But it's a complex world. Everything exists at the same time. There's hip hop now, but reggae music still exists. We have to keep it all going because we like this big complex world. And I defend my right to drink Barolo and Burgundy and Chianti, even though I love the 100 mile diet. There you go. Well said. I will drink to that, Thomas. I'll drink to you as well. So I'll raise a glass to you of your wine. I appreciate your time, your energy, your passion, also what you do 
all of the other days of the year. So thank you for spending your evening Cheers. with us, Thomas, and I wish you Insane. all the best. Thanks for getting all the word out there. Cheers. Okay, take care. Now you can see why I love chatting with Thomas. So here are my takeaways from this discussion. Number one, I love how Thomas takes the esoteric, sometimes woo-woo subject of biodynamic viticulture and makes it practical. As he points out, why wouldn't plants be affected by the solstice or the equinox when wolves howl at the moon? And may I add, it's also long been known that women's menstrual cycles are tied to moon phases, as are the tides. We may not see it or be aware of this lunar earth connection, but it's there and it's powerful. Two, Thomas uses wild yeast not so much for the sake of staying organic or biodynamic as he does for the complexity of flavors that that wild yeast helps to create in the wine. Three, homeopathic or extremely small doses of certain mixtures can help the plant heal itself rather than relying on the medication, if you will, to do the entire job. Reminds me of vaccinations. Four, old vines buffer out extremes in vintages as they've been around long enough and have vine roots thrust deeply enough into the soil to compensate for conditions like extremely hot, dry, cold, or wet years. And five, I'll forever carry with me the notion of dry extract, the essence or soul of a wine boiled down to its essence. And I would extend that metaphor to people as well. You'll find links to my wine reviews of Thomas's wines in Niagara, Burgundy, and Oregon in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 17. So what was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? What did you learn? Share that with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean. On Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. You'll also find links to the social media channels for both Thomas and his wineries, plus bonus tips for this episode at nataliemclean.com forward slash 17. My next guest on the show will be author John Mahoney, who has written several books on wines, but will be focusing on his latest, Is Wine the Source of Civilization? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes but the more interesting question is why. We'll explore that in the next interview. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week. My podcast is easy to find, whether you search on its name, Unreserved Wine Talk, or on my name. Finally, if you want to take your ability to pair wine and food to the next level, join me in a free online video class at nataliemclean.com forward slash class. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.